Hello, this is Robert Rickover at Body Learning, and today my guest is Shirley Wade Linton, who is an Alexander Technique teacher in, you know, I don't know where you are, Victoria or? Where? Actually, up on Vancouver Island, Vancouver Courtney. Vancouver Island. She's on yep. Vancouver, beautiful Vancouver Island <laughs> in British Columbia, Canada. That's right. And welcome to the show, Shirley. Thank you very much, Robert. Shirley is uh, not only an Alexander Technique teacher, but she's also a registered dietitian. She's been a registered dietitian for over 30 years. She's worked in hospital programs, and she's worked with private clients. And her specialty in that field is and was and is working with people with eating disorders. And that's what we want to talk about in a, in a little bit, how the Alexander Technique fits in with that. But, Shirley, if you could begin by just saying a little how you discovered the Alexander Technique and what, what, what your early experiences with it were, and maybe even, if you're okay with this, giving a very short description slash definition of the technique. Okay. Um, well, my my earliest uh, experience was meeting my future husband, and uh, he trained in 79. So he was an Alexander uh, Technique teacher when I met him. But I was completely not interested in that part <laughs> of him, I've got to be honest, <laughs> and thought it was rather strange. Wow. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and in anyway, it was it wasn't until 2002 that uh uh we went down to a workshop in Victoria that was run by Gwen Doby. And I was so impressed with what happened to the people in the workshop and uh, it was quite inspiring and I thought it was a two-day workshop, and at the end of the first day, I said to Michael, "Let's move to London and I want to train to be a teacher." Um, really? So that's yes. It, it was very sudden. So you were married for several years and no interest in the technique. Well, he had only been doing it for about six years, um, and and he stopped very shortly after we got married. He he worked for maybe another two years and then started doing computer stuff and other stuff. So I it see. really. It really wasn't around on a daily basis. Um, now, to be honest, when I rewound the video when I was doing training in London, I realized how much the Alexander Technique had truly affected our lives and how he is and through many experiences teaching the kids how to ski, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, all oh, right. But he, it was, he wasn't blatant about it. He was very indirect about it. <laughs> right, right. So, so rewinding the video, I, I saw how much an effect it had had <laughs> on our relationship. Right. So did you go directly from this workshop to, to London to train or did you have some lessons in between? I only had about three lessons in between. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Wow. Now that's an unusual. That's an unusual story. So obviously, something about it really drew you to it strongly yes. enough that you would you would move six plus thousand miles to to train. Could you say a little what that was in your own experience that that made you make such a dramatic change so quickly? It's it, it is curious. I, I think if I'm honest, what happened was I saw these people come into the workshop that were, excuse me, but sort of like the walking dead. I mean, they were they were old and they were crippled and they had arthritis and they had back pain and I thought, good grief. What is Gwen going to do? How how is this going to work? And I sat there and I watched her so gently, so easily, so lightly work with people. And within a day, these people were looking quite different. So I was actually, and then I started noticing myself, but it was it was more the noticing of other people. And I thought, I want this. I want this in my life. I think this is terrific. Oh, that's, um, that's a fascinating story. You know, when, when I first started taking lessons, um, I noticed all sorts of stuff in myself, but one of the things that really struck me is uh, the teacher I had was was very 
fluid in his lesson arrangements. People would kind of hang out during other people's lessons sometimes. And I would watch him work, and I would think to myself, you know, what this guy is doing is a thousand times more useful and interesting than what I was doing at the time, which was being a research economist, a well-paid job with the Ontario government. But I thought this guy was really doing something really interesting, and I, I kind of want to do that too. I don't think it was quite as instant a conversion as yours, but that's it's an interesting parallel. Well, it, it's it, it's quite a fascinating, and I think at that time also. I mean, I know at that time also, I was pretty burnt out in working with people with eating disorders. It can be tough, mm-hmm. and so when I went off to train, in my head, I was done with people with with eating disorders. I I, I no longer wanted to do that, mm-hmm. and it was only during the training that I that I started noticing. Hmm. Wouldn't this be useful in working with people <laughs> with disordered eating? And and so it crept up very slowly. Um, I I mean, one of the experiences at school was going down to the cafeteria at break and watching the students who had been so mindful and conscious and aware during class shove food into their mouths. It was like wow. <laughs> What a huge stimulus food is. And even people without disordered eating have this huge stimulus and the habits are so strong. Um, I, I was quite fascinated by the unmindfulness of eating. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and, and we should say here for our listeners that um, w- when you talk about a, a school, you're talking about an Alexander Technique training course, which is typically about three years in length and yes. pretty much full time for three years. And I, I wonder, I think at this point, since we haven't done it yet, if you could just, when you say it could be helpful for people with eating uh, disorders, maybe yes. this is time, a t- time enough to, a time to, um, actually provide a very short definition or description of the Alexander Technique for people? Um, sure. It, it's always very difficult <laughs> to do that. It's always a challenge, isn't it's it? It's always yeah. a challenge. Um, I think the very short answer, kind of the abrupt answer, is psychophysical education. Mm-hmm. But I don't like that much. I, my tendency is to say that it's, it's a very gentle way to change our habitual ways of being. And that to me speaks a little more accurately to certainly my experience. Because I really like the gentleness of it. I like that it looks at habits. And those are habits of our minds, habits of our bodies, habits of our emotions, just how we are habitually in the world and brings it up to an awareness and a consciousness. And then what we do with that is choice. So there's, you know, there's, there's no force and, and that's that. So it's a very different experience for a 60 year old electrician who's been working with his hands above his head all his life than working with a 16 year old girl with anorexia. It's, it's, it's profoundly a different experience depending on where you are in your habits of being. And we should probably say that uh, Alexander Technique teachers use a combination of verbal instruction and so uh, very gentle hands-on guidance. We use our hands to suggest the direction of release, for example, to convey information in a way that words alone might not be fully sufficient. Would you, would you agree with that or would you like to add to that at all? Well, I would, I would definitely agree with that. And I think it is that combination. And without the combination, I've had teachers work with me who do no verbal and it feels like something is lacking. And I've had people work with me who are more verbal and don't have so much hands on. And again, I think it is, it has to be that, well, I think it has to be that combination of both. Right. And and we should say too that Alexander 
technique teaching is not a standardized product by any means. <laughs> teachers teachers all develop their own ways of teaching. And in fact, Alexander himself anticipated that in his writing where he's, he says somewhere that, you know, teachers have to figure out their own method of doing, of, of conveying this, this information. But at any, at any event, um, you saw those connections and when you, did you return to Vic, Victoria or to Vancouver Island after the training course? Yes, we did. Um, you know, we knew we were only going for three years, and so we rented the house and mm-hmm. came back and started the practice, um, which <laughs> was very exciting and and um, rather daunting. And very early on, I think it was the first week we were back, the um, a local agency called the Nursing Center around here asked me if I would come in and work uh, a couple days of work in eating disorders, right? <laughs> so there I was back doing it. Um, and, but I was a different person. And I, I now had this amazing skill or not, I don't want to say that, I, that this potential. And as I sat doing the talk, talk therapy, which is what is standard with eating disorders, I realized that this huge piece was missing and I wanted to do it in a different way. Um, And were you able to do that in that particular job or did you have to kind of go off on your own to do that? Well, I I do it privately, but in that particular job, they were willing for me to, they were like, whatever, Shirley. (laughs) You just do what you do. Now, obviously, with the person's permission. That's what every Alexander teacher wants to hear, isn't it? (laughs) Yes. yes. (laughs) We don't understand what you're talking about. Just just do it. (laughs) Just do it. Um, Because people with eating disorders almost by definition are completely out of touch with their bodies they i mean a lot of people are walking around disembodied but people with eating disorders are have a terrible relationship with their bodies they hate their bodies they fear their bodies they have zero trust they are not communicating in any useful way with their bodies and so to continue to just do talk therapy with people you cannot convince an 89 pound anorexic girl that she isn't fat because it's not rational Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but if you can gently bring this same 89 pound girl and do some table work with her very gently people should know that's with clothes on it's it's all very gentle i demonstrate before i have people get on the table it's full permission they begin to change their relationship with their body because when I'm being the Alexander teacher, well, the size of the body, as we know, is not relevant. We are not looking for that at all. We're looking for release and an openness and a mind that changes from anxiety and fear to calmer, alert, and more quiet. And more observant. So when that change begins to happen, people are kind of fascinated with that because they start a new relationship that is not based on size and shape. And that opens a door in a very indirect way to the beginning of a new relationship with their body. So it's, it's quite sneaky <laughs> in mm-hmm. a lovely mm-hmm. way. So um, could, would it be would it be um, uh, it, and not to oversimplify, but just listening to what you're saying that maybe that process, particularly table work, and we should just talk. We should say later exactly what that is, but that that would help someone who maybe was um, obsessing over their size uh, would nudge them in the direction of being interested in how they function. Yes. Not not sort of what what am I positionally or size wise, but how how does this mechanism in which I live actually work? Yes. And that's yes. a quite a big change of focus. 
it's a huge change of focus. And it, as you say, it takes them away from from one of the root, I assume, a root cause that would cause someone not to starve themselves or, or not eat enough, right? To starve themselves, to to binge and purge, to right. overeat, because, you know, compulsive overeating is, is the same thing. And what is true for people with all eating disorders, depending where they are on the spectrum, and and we have to remember that eating disorders, it's a continuum. It is very normal behavior. It's not great behavior, but it's very normal behavior in our society for women especially to diet and to dislike their bodies. That's pretty normal. That's in the 70 to 80% of women below the age of 50 are at any given day on a diet. So you just go along the continuum and at the extreme end of that, you get disordered eating. But it's not like behavior that isn't (laughs) well supported in our society. Um, So girls very quickly feel themselves on the runway from the time they're about 13, where they are now being seen as an object of beauty or not beauty or whatever rather than continuing to experience their bodies kind of from the inside out um mm. so so to to have the experience of what i'm looking for is release and movement and some poise and finding the back and having the neck be free is a brand new experience for them and you have to go slowly <laughs> yes absolutely yes. <laughs> there's no point in trying to force someone to give up tension no. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't work um just to say a, a word or two about table work because it's a term you use and our listeners might not be familiar with it uh, the the alexander technique in general is about teaching people how to stand sit move through life more efficiently but uh, table work is a is a is a part of the teaching methodology that typically has someone lying on a a firm surface, usually a massage table or something like that. And uh, the the two key two key components are a, a bit of support under the head and the knees elevated relative to the hips. Uh, what the, one thing that does is tend to take compression off the spine and tends to encourage the kind of releases that we're interested in sort of sets a a good tone for those releases to take place in. Um, And I I like to think of table work as a way of sort of recalibrating what you think is doing nothing or what you think zero Mm -hmm. is in terms of activity because almost everybody has zero um, calibrated incorrectly. That is to say that all of us really tend to think that we have to do more than we think we do. Yes. And and taking someone and and working with them very gently and very very gradually as you describe but in a situation where they don't have to worry about the gravitational field they they they're fully supported uh it's possible to learn to release a little more quickly in some cases than if they were sitting or standing or or moving. Yes. So, yes. Um, so would it be fair to say that your your basic if if I were a person and I came to you uh, for the, because of a, a eating disorder that you would not address the eating disorder directly at least initially? Well, I would certainly give you the choice. If someone walks in the door and they've come to see me for an eating disorder, I would tell them that they have choices of two approaches. And I would say 99.9% of the people that I've seen since graduating to be an Alexander teacher have chosen the the double, the two-pronged approach. In other words, we still do some talk talk um, because that, is rather important, but at least half of the session and it grows um, is Alexander technique. Mm-hmm. So, so the, it's it's kind of a combined thing, um, 
but people are quite fascinated by it. I mean, I've read in the literature that people with eating disorders don't like to be touched. That has not been my experience at all. Now, I, I think there's touching and there's touching, and when we touch people doing an Alexander lesson, it's a very different kind of thing. It's so non-invasive, and people experience that, I think, very quickly. And non-invasive um, and, and non-judgmental, too. And non-judgmental, say. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and um, I think that's – and I think people, even if they can't articulate exactly what is different about, uh, let's call it Al- an Alexander Technique teacher's touch – I think most people can sense that it's not your standard touch. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I I I, I really agree with you and, and I think that is such a shift and people with eating disorders, if they've been in in treatment or they're just in their lives everyone's all concerned about them there's an awful lot of judgment around and an awful lot of fear and an awful lot of reaction to that plus physically they're i mean we're now talking people who are underweight they're cold they're cold they're tense they're 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 really withdrawn into themselves and there's a huge emotional component about they're they're quite collapsed and by that I mean that they're the chest is a little hollow the shoulders are tense and kind of rounded they're they're fearful um and that's the position a lot of people present with and so to come up from that is often a nausea is experienced, um, there's a little fear, you, you have to go quite gently and, and quite slowly because it, there is an emotional component to it, which brings me back to the electrician who's, you know, or the, or the computer geek who's been sitting at his computer and he's collapsed and down, but that's, there's not the emotional component with him. Mm-hmm. It's 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 just kind of bad habits. So bad how, habits how about someone? How about someone who is is a compulsive eater and is uh, do, do they? In your experience, do do they have a different? Typically, have a different postural set than, say, someone who doesn't eat very much or eats too little. Um, typically. Actually, um, the compulsive eater doesn't have that collapse. What they have, though, is quite disembodied. They really, (laughs) really don't trust their bodies. And they really are quite um, insecure about, can you actually lift my arm? Is it not too heavy for you? (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. it's, Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're quite worried about the size of their body and, and I always talk to them about bones, that I'm really just moving bones. That's, that's what I'm doing. And people like that a lot. It's kind of getting into a silent place that has nothing to do with muscles or fat. It's, it's the structure of the body, the, the, the silent support of the body. And, and that, that has really been very useful um, in in talking about the bones of the body and and how we don't need to grip so much that we can move with more poise and and elegance. And what what really works for people with compulsive eating is the whole idea of inhibition, the whole idea of of having that pause not being so reactive and how that sneaks into their eating life ah i don't you know i have a feeling that comes up and what i normally do with this feeling is i eat over it i feel lonely i eat potato chips those two things go together now when the feeling of loneliness comes up i could just not do what i habitually do all the time i could sit with this for a minute and and that's how it translates into working with people with with compulsive eating. It's I don't even say those sentences. They come back and tell me those sentences. It's it's quite fun. 
So it's, again, the indirect nature of the work that, in a sense, makes it as, as powerful as it is. Um, when when you, you, you use the term inhibition just now, and I think we need to explain that <laughs> this is not Freudian inhibition. No. <laughs> that, uh, through a curious uh, accident of history, uh, Alexander, uh, who was more or less a contemporary of Freud, actually, but he came up with the term inhibition, which for him meant just basically saying no to harmful habits once you'd figured out what they were, but not repression at all. There was no idea of repressing. And of course, Freud used it more in the repressive sense. And it was a a no-no, you know, for for Freud, whereas Alexander thought it was uh, very central to his method. But it's a different inhibition. And unfortunately for us, Alexander teachers, Freud became a lot better known than Alexander. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's too bad, really, because <laughs> it is. We'd all be yes, a lot. A we'd dangerous. all be a lot better yes. off and happier if it had. And we, being Alexander teachers, certainly uh, better off and happier if it had been the other way around. But um, I, and and when you were describing just now the way you work with with someone who who is a compulsive eater. By again, as you say, talking about bones, talking about um, how their body functions, you're getting them away from uh, being overly anxious about their actual size. Because size is not the issue that we're really interested in as Alexander teachers. Yes, it, not it, at all. It hardly, <laughs> it hardly interests us, really, except, you know, insofar as it might, someone might be so heavy that they're putting a lot of extra pressure on their knees or hips or something like that. But generally, size doesn't correlate in any way that I can think of with um, how how efficiently someone functions. Exactly. And it's that alone the, yeah. puts them in a, a world which is not the normal world out there. Like we are a size obsessed culture. Yes, we are. Yeah. And all of a sudden they are with people, Alexander teachers, who you're right, that doesn't factor in. That's not what we're looking for. <laughs> and people get that very quickly. We don't even have to say it. Right, and, and, they, right. and they really do get it at a very profound level. Hmm. Now, I, I I know that in recent years, there ha- there's been at least one book that's come out. I believe it's called Conscious Eating. And uh-huh. I, I think there are other books with similar titles. There was one that that was a, sort of a minor bestseller a few years ago. Are you familiar with that book at all? Um, I don't know whether I know the conscious eating. There's certainly been a lot. Janine Roth has written many books, uh, Mindful Eating those kinds of things, and, yes. And what's your general take on, on their approach from, from oh, an Alexander Technique point of view? I, I think it's quite brilliant. Um, actually, in the early 80s, I went to a workshop that was run by Stephen Levine, who has nothing to do with Alexander Technique or eating disorders. He's in the death and dying field, and he wanted us to do one thing mindfully before he died or before we all died, and he had us bring our lunch. And my dietitian alarm bells all went off, and I thought, good grief, what is this? And he brought us through a mindful eating exercise. This was uh, 1982, and it changed my practice. I went back to the place that I worked and told all the doctors, I am no longer doing reducing diets, forget it, and this was 82. This was a long time ago. Um, I am doing mindful eating with people now, and they were like, whatever. <laughs> and, and, and how would you d- define what is meant by mindful eating or I... conscious eating, perhaps would be another, another phrase? Yes, and it, it's, it's interesting because I, I, I did this with the, my classmates at the Alexander School in London, um, because it fits in exactly with Alexander Technique, and yet there are areas of our life that, that we just kind of miss those places, and eating is one of them. So what I would say is you have to be, number one, in touch with your body. In other words, am I hungry? Am I hungry? Am I full? What is my body telling me? That is the number one question. And if the answer is, I'm hungry physically, not emotionally, but I'm hungry, then 
you get some food. And so you mm-hmm. eat some food, and if you can hold it in your hand, hold it in your hand. If not, it's on a plate, and you smell it. You know, we don't even smell food anymore. You smell the food. You smell the banana. I know you have smelled bananas before and eaten a thousand, but you haven't smelled this banana. So you smell the banana. You look at the banana. You taste the banana. Does it taste differently in different parts of your mouth? You swallow. You check in with your body. What is my body saying about this? And it doesn't matter what you eat. It can be healthy food. It can be potato chips and cheesies. It doesn't matter. It's just keep checking in. What is my mouth saying about this? What is my body saying about this? And at a certain moment in time, your body goes, thank you. That's enough. And it's very subtle because our minds are so powerful. They're like, well, I haven't eaten enough. I'm not going to get to eat for two hours. Blah, blah, blah. But the body is like, thank you. And all two-year-olds are mindful eaters. We yeah. start that way. Yeah. We all start that way. And then we go to school. It just everything changes. It's interesting you would mention uh, very young children because I, I think there has been some research that uh, young children, if presented with pretty much any possible food that that could that could be presented to them as an option, will fairly quickly gravitate to the right amounts of good food. Yes, within it, that's, a week. Th- that's assuming that no one suggests to them, hey, uh, you know, ease off on the potato trip, chips and go for the broccoli. You can't, you can't have that. You have to really nope. have it all there, have all as much as you want. And, and kids seem to just, after, they, they may binge a little bit on the candy or whatever, but pretty quickly they develop a very healthy, uh, healthy diet. Mm-hmm. Now, it's, it's a lot easier if... There's not a whole bunch of junk food around for kids. Well, sure, you don't want to yes. overload it with pop tarts, but <laughs> right. but I mean, yes. you don't, but, but you don't have to be real. You don't no. have to be prescriptive about it. You you give them a choice, and you know there's some people that are not going to ever want to eat broccoli, and why would you ever force them to? I guess you exactly. Know? I mean, that, it, the the nutrients can be gotten in other ways. Um, I'm I'm wondering about another aspect of eating that I think might be related to what you're talking about, but might also be a little bit different. Um, and I'm thinking of the actual act of eating itself in terms of how we accomplish it. That is, you know, it seems like a pretty straightforward thing. You pick a piece of food up with a fork, you you <laughs> bring it to your mouth, you open your mouth, and then you chew it and swallow it. But a lot of people have developed habits around that that are that may not cause them to be um, uh, have an eating disorder, as 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 you would see it. But 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 have habits of how they what they do with their heads and their necks and their jaws when they eat, and you can see this. Yes. A lot in a restaurant, for example, if you just watch other people eating, a lot of people tend to kind of poke their head forward towards yes. the fork, and that, of course, generally involves some extra neck tension. And we Alexander Technique teachers are very sensitive to that because <laughs> neck tension is uh, the, the neck is a pretty the, the state of uh, a person's neck is a pretty important. Uh, determiner of other things, so we tend to be on the lookout for that. But uh, but uh, I'm sure there are other things with jaw use, for example, with even the swallowing process, that people have developed habits around eating that they are totally unaware of. And Ab- absolutely. Yeah. And do you work at all with people in that kind of situation? And again, how how would if so, how would the Alexander technique come into play? Well, again, it's, you know, the first thing, people have to be aware of how they are eating. And and you're right, often people at a table, because in North America, we generally sit at chairs at a table, which is really the most difficult way of eating. In in other cultures, they might be on the floor. They In Japanese cultures, you might be, you know, cross-legged, using chopsticks. It, there's a very big cultural component. But 
we kind of slouch forward. A lot of people are kind of collapsed. And then you're right. We just kind of poke our head and shove the food in. People eat very quickly. They don't chew very well. And and often, too, you know, people are eating in cars in our culture. People are eating on the couch. People are eating in places where the body, they're not supporting their own body. And and so they're often collapsed in a chair and and very tense and chewing very quickly. Um, so that chewing and swallowing process is taking place against a background of often quite a bit of extra tension, unconscious yes. tension. Unconscious so, tension. And so just as neck, neck and say neck and jaw tension can interfere with speaking or singing, which of course was Alexander's original thing, speaking, it could, I, I, it would certainly interfere with something uh, like eating. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and I also think digestion. I mean, mm-hmm. in my travels as a dietitian working in hospitals and seeing patients of, you know, everything, not just eating disorders, people with diverticulitis and IBS and a lot of the digestive problems, again, you begin to see a very collapsed structure where, and I don't know, I have no proof of this, but I have often said to patients to, you know, to stand up after you're eating, move around a little bit, give some room in your guts, in your intestines to digest this food that you've just eaten because our whole position, how we hold ourselves, our use affects everything in the body. And people are quite astounded by that. It's 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 news that yes i agree with that and and maybe to amplify your observation that people are often quite collapsed uh, as they eat um, someone listening to this might think well okay so they're just people are kind of giving in to gravity and uh, you know that's not great but actually uh, co- being collapsed is a fairly active process of pulling yourself in on yourself yes so it's not it's not the gravity that you know when someone's slumping for example and 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 they say well gravity is catching up with me actually nothing could be further from the truth if they really were responsive to gravity they'd be they'd be releasing up because yes. the way we're set up and we won't go into it here but the whole head neck relationship is is designed for us to use gravity to release gently away from the surface of the earth, not pull ourselves down into ourselves. But the point I wanted to make here was that collapse doesn't mean just a sinking in. It actually usually is a pretty strong pulling or tensing in through our whole chest and abdominal cavity. And and I can't imagine that the stomach and the intestines can do their thing as well with that extra pressure on them they cannot <laughs> no. yeah. you know it's not the it's design it's not going to happen <laughs> it's not going to happen and it, it does make a huge difference yep so um i'm wondering uh Shirley, we've we've covered a lot of uh, mm-hmm. ideas here is there anything else that you, that we haven't touched on that that you'd want to mention before we we bring the conversation to an end I think the only last thing that I'd like to say is the word befriend. And in in the area of eating disorders, because the hate is str- so strong for the body, the idea, even the word to befriend the body is radical and shocking for people. Mm-hmm. And And I think Alexander Technique has a way of doing that, that, we begin to listen to the body in this gentle way and we're getting information from it that we do begin to befriend our bodies. And and that is probably the most powerful change that we can make that then sneaks into the, the rest of our lives, especially if you have an eating disorder. Well, especially if you're human. If you're a human that's, being. If right. you're human. <laughs> um, and that's, so, yeah. you know, that's a very nice uh, way to describe the Alexander Technique in general. It's, it is a very powerful way of befriending yourself. 
-hmm. You learn about yourself, you learn about things that you might want to change, and you learn some very specific strategies for changing them. Mm -hmm. And what yes. could be what could be more befriending of yourself than that? So, um, Shirley, thank you so much for being on the program today. It's been a real pleasure chatting with you. Thank you, Robert. Um, I, I really yeah. appreciate it. My my guest today has been Shirley Wade Linton, who lives on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada. And wh what's the name of the town you're in? We're in Courtney. Boy, I have never heard of that, um, <laughs> but it can't be too far from Victoria. It's not too far. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it, it, so if you're in, if you're if you're on Vancouver Island, uh, um, definitely we'll put a link to Shirley uh, Shirley's website next to the interview. And if anything that we've talked about today um, it interests you. Uh, find an Alexander teacher in in your area and and uh, have a lesson or two or three give give it a give it a chance and see what you think. You might be amazed at what you'll discover about yourself. So again, Shirley, thank you so much for being on the program today. My my pleasure, Robert. Thanks very much. <laughs>